I'm really excited to introduce our next doctor, Dr. Darren Ingalls. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Kristen. Well, before we get started, because I know we're going to be talking about Lyme and autism, which is such an important topic, um, can you tell people a little bit about where your practice is and, you know, obviously a little bit more about you? Sure. Well, I'm a naturopathic doctor by training. I've been practicing for about 20 years, and prior to that, I was a clinical microbiologist. So I worked at a large teaching hospital in Chicago and did microbiology and immunology lab testing. Um, I got into autism about 19 years ago, shortly after I started my own clinical practice. Uh, but my focus has always been on chronic immune disorders, environmental medicine, and really looking at these different external factors that influence people's health. I happen to get Lyme disease myself about 18 years ago, so having a personal experience with Lyme uh, and certainly having a background as a microbiologist, that really, of course, piqued my interest in getting into the Lyme world and other infectious diseases and just learning more about how they influence health beyond just the infection. So, you know, that's really kind of become the basis of my clinical practice. And currently I practice in Irvine, California. And so when you think about Lyme, you know, when I first ever heard the word Lyme disease, I would have never associated Lyme and autism. Right. Why today do we associate those two together? Yeah. Well, you know, the common thread that we see between both conditions is that there's this element of immune dysfunction. And I think for our kids with autism, whether it's something they inherited or something we're born with, there is that element of something with the immune system that just doesn't work well. And primarily, their body tends to overreact to things that are normal to you and I. You know, what happens with people with Lyme is after they get infected, we see that similar kind of immune dysfunction occur. So there's something that seems to be that trigger, and whether it's Lyme or, or some other, you know, food, mold, pollen, that's aggravating the immune system and sort of creating this element of almost like autoimmunity. So, you know, my practice being heavily autism and Lyme, and people say, well, those are two very different conditions. I'm like, well, fundamentally, the, the underlying immune problem is really quite the same. So it really is looking at, you know, how do we start altering the immune system in a way that starts to behave more of the way that's really supposed to. And now, you know, I'm from Southern California, and I never really thought about Lyme before because in my mind I think, oh, it has to be a deer and there has right. to be a tick. And, and so when they first started introducing to me, oh, you should get your son tested for Lyme, I thought, well, why? We've never been in a forest, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I've, I've come to find out that that's just not true because you can get it in other ways, correct? Right. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of misinformation about Lyme. You know, it's unfortunate that we discovered Lyme. For people who don't know, Lyme is named after Lyme, Connecticut. It's a city in Connecticut. And having been in Connecticut practicing for 18 years, it was about a half hour up the road from where I lived. And that's where we discovered it. But the reality is, is that this is not a new organism. This organism has been around for more than 5,000 years. It's just something, you know, since really the early 80s has changed in the way that our body is responding to this organism. So, you know, we've seen this in the course of history, you know, with tuberculosis and other types of diseases where at one point they were very infectious, they caused a lot of problems, and then as time's gone on, it seems to have mutated and changed to a point that we don't really uh, see those kind of clinical effects anymore. So the fact that Lyme has become more prominent over the last 40 years is probably a bit more than just the fact that this is a new infection. We know it's not new, but what is it that's changed in how our body is reacting to that organism? And what we've learned now in 40 plus years of research is yes, you know, ticks do tend to be the primary uh, carriers of Lyme disease. However, you know, we've got good evidence that mosquitoes and fleas and other biting insects may transmit Lyme. We've got good documentation now it can be passed from mom to baby. And there's even some new research that suggests it might even be sexually transmitted as they found it in the secretions of both women's vaginal area and in the semen of men. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense because we're seeing a lot of people now who test positive for Lyme disease and they don't necessarily live in areas that we consider endemic. But the other thing we've seen over the last 40 years, you know, we used to think of it being kind of a Northeast New England thing in the Central Midwest, but because of the migration of ticks especially, we're now seeing it in every single state in this country. It's been reported in all 50 states, including Hawaii and Alaska. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to live in a state where Lyme's endemic. Plus, most people I know, they travel, <laughs> you know, they go to areas that aren't, you know, so even if you live in the middle of the desert in Arizona, you've probably gone outside of that area somewhere else. But we know, you know, California, where you, you and I both live, it's now the fifth fastest growing state for Lyme disease in the country. So, you know, having relocated out to California fairly recently, I've been surprised at how many doctors really aren't aware that Lyme is as problematic as it is, just because they were trained somewhere in school that it's really a New England problem. But the reality nowadays is that we find it everywhere and 
no one's really immune from it. Uh, I see people in New York City, it's a concrete jungle, who get Lyme, people who live out in the desert. So I think we have a lot of people where we don't necessarily know where they got infected, but they have evidence that they have been infected and we have to deal with them. Well, and I know that sometimes you can take a Lyme test and it can test negative, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we just unfortunately have terrible problems with lab testing and Lyme disease. And this has been an ongoing thorn in the uh, infectious disease world forever. Uh, the testing has gotten better, but unfortunately the CDC recommendation of what's really what's called a two-tier testing where you do a Lyme screen first, if that's positive, it then goes to what's called a Lyme Western blot, which is a bit more of a conclusive test. You know, that test uh, has not changed in 40 years. Uh, we know that the sensitivity of that test is really poor, actually less than 50%. So literally half the people that have Lyme don't get picked up. And that test was also intended for people that have acute Lyme disease. It doesn't really test people who have chronic or persistent Lyme. So, you know, we've got different ways that we can measure it. Again, some labs, some tests are better than others, but the reality is, is that Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. It's really based on your signs and symptoms, particularly if you've excluded a lot of other conditions that mimic Lyme. And Lyme disease, for people who don't know, it's called the great imitator of the great mimic. It looks like a lot of other different diseases. So you have to go through the process of trying to rule Lyme in, but also ruling out other conditions that might look like Lyme. And what are symptoms? Like if somebody, you know, all of a sudden didn't feel right, or especially that of a person with autism, what symptoms would we, should we be looking for? Well, classic Lyme symptoms, you know, you look and feel acutely ill. So joint pain, headache, fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes. Uh, the two telltale signs and symptoms that people get that's very uh, classic to Lyme, one is what's called a bullseye rash. So it's a rash that you can get anywhere on your body, and it literally looks like a bullseye or a target, where it's sort of alternating red, clear, red, clear, concentric rings. Usually starts very small, it's flat, it doesn't tend to be itchy, and then over the course of weeks to months, it starts to spread out. Uh, there's only one thing we know that causes that, and that's Lyme. Uh, the other symptom that's very characteristic is what we call migratory joint pain, which means that one day my right knee hurts, the next day it's my left elbow, and then my left ankle, and it, the, the pain just kind of seems to move. Again, other types of autoimmune conditions, we don't tend to see that kind of migratory pattern. So those two symptoms are very characteristic of Lyme. In reality, there's upwards of 80 to 100 symptoms associated with Lyme disease. And for our children with autism, Again, there's a lot of overlap in symptoms, particularly when you're talking about different neurological symptoms, developmental delays, because we can see that with both. And what I've observed in my kids with autism who also have Lyme, and in my patient population, it's about 30% of the kids that test positive for Lyme. Uh, their Lyme symptoms get better, but they still have autism. But I think the one thing that's really helpful as a parent is that it's now teasing out symptoms you may have just attributed, oh, well, that's just autism, now realize, oh, that was actually not related to autism. And for example, I had a child that was a toe walker, and uh, he had Lyme disease. We treat his Lyme. He stopped toe walking. It had nothing to do with autism. It wasn't that neurological thing that we see in some kids who are toe walkers. Uh, so not every kid who's a toe walker has Lyme, but in this particular child, that was the case. So often we will see some of these symptoms start to improve, and at least it helps you narrow your focus on the things you really do need to treat that may be still related to autism and other neurological issues that at least aren't related to Lyme. Well, and so you talked about joint pain. Many of our kids couldn't even tell us right. if they had joint pain. So how do we rule that out or how do we even know to look for that? Maybe they got bit, but we don't, maybe we never see a ring. Yeah. And I've heard that from many families. They had no clue. They never would have thought in a million years a child had Lyme. Yeah. And it turned out the child had Lyme. Well, the one thing I find with my parents who have special needs kids is they are really good observers. They're better than most doctors. And so it's the observation, even for your child, if they're nonverbal, and you'll see them sometimes put pressure against the joint. They're trying to relieve the pain themselves. We see this as the kids with the gut issues, right? They lean over the chair. You see them push against their belly. Same thing we'll see with the joint. You'll see them push on the joint, try and apply pressure. Sometimes you'll notice in the way that they walk, their gait might be off. Uh, in this particular child I mentioned before, that was the one thing I observed is that he had a funny gait even for a toe walker. Uh, so it's really just kind of using your observation powers and seeing, well, what seems different with my child? And certainly discuss it with your doctor. Is that something that might be, again, typical to the neurological syndrome? Does it seem to be a little bit odd even for that? But often we will see those other signs and symptoms. Uh, in some cases, you'll see swollen joints. I've had several kids where their knees are you know, swollen, and you can see that. Sometimes they even look red. They look infected. So that's a bit more rare, but uh, occasionally you will see that as well. 
And so how does somebody find a doctor in the autism field that is treating Lyme and autism? Well, fortunately, I think a lot of doctors, particularly those that are MAPS trained, uh, tend to be aware of Lyme. Uh, I have several colleagues that, uh, again, are treating autism and are very aware of Lyme as one of the many, many things we have to kind of rule out through our differential diagnosis. So I think if parents get in touch with a MAPS trained doctor, there's a good probability that they'll have an awareness of Lyme and know the appropriate steps to take to get them appropriately tested and treated. And is there, um, when you do the Lyme test, is that a blood test? Uh, right now, the best testing out there is blood testing. There are other labs that are uh, doing urine testing. Uh, I'm a little hesitant of recommending those labs at this point because they haven't really been validated. Uh, but there are several labs that offer good blood testing that uh, gives you pretty good results. And how long before somebody finds out if they've tested positive for it? You know, so the labs that I use, uh, one of the main labs I use is called MDL. It's Medical Diagnostics Labs. They're in New Jersey. I get results back under a week. Uh, I also use a lab called Global Lyme Diagnostics in North Carolina, and what I like about that lab is that uh, there's actually several different strains of Borrelia, that's the organism that causes Lyme. Most standard lab testing out there is only looking at one strain. We now know there's many strains that can cause Lyme disease, so the Global Lyme test is great because it actually looks at all the different strains. So depending on when someone or where someone may have been exposed, you have a higher probability of picking up all the different strains with that test. So I actually tend to run those two in parallel, but iGenX out of Palo Alto offers really great testing. Uh, Armin Labs out of Germany offers good testing. So we've got a lot of different labs. I kind of you know have that discussion with parents based on finances and where you live and what's available. You know, for parents who live in New York, unfortunately New York is very strict with a lot of testing that's available. So a lot of good testing isn't available. Uh, so it just depends on where you're located. And so now, um, let's say you have a child with autism, if you, do, if you get the test done and that's negative, do we not worry about it anymore? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was that simple. <laughs> well, you know, this is the problem with the testing is that, you know, false positives with most tests are actually pretty unusual, but false negatives are very common. So I think, again, uh, Good clinicians will be mindful that a negative test doesn't rule out the possibility. So again, you still have to do your diligence and rule out other possibilities. Uh, and there are some kids where we are very suspicious based on either where they live or their symptoms and their test comes back negative. Sometimes we'll do a therapeutic trial, we'll treat and sometimes what happens when you do that, you stir the pot up, stir the pot up get the immune system activated. Your first test might be negative, but once you start treating and you get things stirred up, you do the test again, now it tests positive. And we've had several, several cases of that occurring. So I think, you know, with the kind of treatments certainly that we're using, they're mostly herbal, botanical. They're not likely to harm a child. They're relatively safe. So we can introduce a therapy that's not likely to harm the child. We might stir up the pot just enough to see if we get a, a different kind of immune reaction, retest them at a later date, uh, and just see if something changes. Is there anything a parent can do to prevent trying to get Lyme for their child? Well, particularly for parents who have, you know, live in endemic areas, uh, I think you have to be very mindful when your kids are outdoors uh, about what they wear, what you put on them. So, you know, particularly for people who live in endemic areas, I recommend long clothing when outdoors. Uh, it's supposed to be light colored. Is that what I heard? Uh, I don't not know. The, the color? <laughs> yeah, I don't think the color matters okay. as much. I mean, it's really more of you know, you want a barrier between your skin and the tick. You know, it's very hard for a tick because of the length of their, their, their bite, so to speak. It's very hard for them to bite through your clothes to your skin. So having that protective barrier is really the best thing. Even when it's hot and humid uh, and it seems kind of miserable, it is safer. And we also have good evidence that essential oils uh, applied externally can be very beneficial in protecting against ticks. So I think, you know, you can do something very proactive, you know, when your kid's going to be outdoors. You know, we don't want to, you know, hold kids up inside and never let them be kids and enjoy being outdoors. But we do have to be mindful about their exposure. So, you know, long clothing, essential oil sprays, and even the essential oils, fortunately, you, you can even spray directly on the skin. And, you know, the CDC has even got some research suggesting that these are beneficial. I am uh, hesitant about using DEET. Uh, which is the standard recommendation of preventing ticks. Unfortunately, it's a very toxic chemical, and for our kids who are so sensitive anyway, I would be very concerned about the negative impact of using DEET on them. But uh, again, there's good essential oil formulas out there. Uh, there's one called TikTok Naturals that's very effective that I like. Um, so that's available in, all over the country.
And I know you wrote a book. Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. <laughs> What's the name of your book? So the book is called The Lime Solution. Uh, it came out March of 2018, so it's relatively new. Uh, and this is sort of a combination of my own journey. So I got Lyme disease in 2002 and went through three years of basically hell trying to get my health back. Uh, so it was my own personal experience and then applying what I learned uh, to my patients and now having treated about 5,000 Lyme patients uh, I found what works and what doesn't work and what I realized with my own process is just that you know again the infection was the first part of the problem but it really turned into an autoimmune issue and then having to learn how do you deal with the autoimmune problem because at that point killing the bug isn't the only thing you can do and I think this is where you know if we deviate away from the conventional infectious disease doctors that just want to give you three weeks of antibiotics and you're done you know, A, we know that isn't nearly long enough to kill the bug. It's an extremely slow-growing organism, so you need longer treatment anyway. But we also want treatments that work well with the body instead of against it. And the one thing we learned about a lot of these antibiotics used to treat Lyme is that they damage the mitochondria. Well, how many of our kids have mitochondrial issues? So if we can use other things, particularly herbal medicines that help support the body, they don't damage the mitochondria, they don't damage your normal gut flora, we have a much better chance of helping you know, bring that load of organism down while we're working on dealing with all these other kind of immune issues. So. And can you show the book one more time? Sure. And where can somebody get that book? So this is available all over the internet. You can get through Amazon, you can get through Barnes & Noble. Any major uh, book retailer will carry it. It's available in audiobook as well for people who prefer audiobooks. You know, but what I've really outlaid is a five-step plan. So this book was written for you, the patient. You know, this is something that you, whether you've got a doctor working with you or not, you can do 95% of this book on your own. There's really only one chapter in there about different therapies you really need medical guidance on. But everything else, you know, these are herbs you can take. This is a diet you can follow. This is how you can help heal the gut. This is how you can boost mitochondria. So it really kind of walks you through step by step, you know, how to manage this on your own. I mean, I'm always in favor of having a medical professional help guide you through some of this, but I've just come across so many people who live in areas where they just don't have someone to help them with that. So this is something that anybody can do on their own. And even for kids, you know, all the dosing for everything is in there. Everything in there is safe. Again, fortunately, side effects are rare uh, with most of the protocols that I've recommended and fairly easily managed if there is any kind of adverse effect. But uh, again, That's a great resource. Yeah. Well, so for those families out there that are watching right now that maybe just got the diagnosis and they don't know where to turn, what kind of advice can you give them? Well, I think the best kind of advice is start doing your homework. Start finding someone you know that you can work with uh, either in your local area or, you know, fortunately a lot of us work through telemedicine. So if you don't have someone in your local area, a lot of us, you know, because we're doing diet and nutrition and things that are really safe and easy to manage no matter where you are in the country, you know, get someone on your team to start helping you. It's such a complex, complex issue. It's just very hard to navigate it on your own. So I think, you know, start building that team of people around you that's going to help support you walk you through the steps you need for you and your child so that you're not just hanging out there by yourself. And also, as you know, there's so many great parent resource groups that are free, accessible, they're online, and I think having that additional parent support with the professional support, it just gives you and your child the best chance to recover. Well, thank you, Dr. Ingalls, for everything you do, and thanks for, you know, providing hope today. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks.